Okay. So let me just welcome everybody. Um, my name is John Thakra. I'm your co-host today <clears throat> on this Saturday session of the Bioregional uh, Regeneration Summit. Um, it's been, for anybody who's been dipping into the sessions before, extraordinarily rich and diverse, and I hope we can add to that. Um, I've got two guests with me that you'll meet in a moment, and I've asked them kind of to introduce themselves um, by uh, with three questions. One, introduce yourself in one sentence. Tell us of an experience or encounter that changed you. And then thirdly, tell us about a project or case study that inspires you today. So I think it's only fair that I probably should do that exercise first. So um, in one sentence, I'm a writer and curator based in southern France, a Brit, um, with a probably 20-year history of trying to understand the potential of bioregions and bioregioning. And I've just met people around the world who have inspired me in different ways to keep up that learning journey, which is why I'm so happy to be here today. An experience that changed me was indeed in South India, probably 20 years ago, when I was with a friend called Jogi Pangal, who took me to a village outside Bangalore. And there was some villagers standing in a circle, staring at a large patch of grain and a bunch of chickens that were walking around eating the grain. And I said, why have they arranged the grain in this circle? And everybody laughed absolutely uproariously, said they're not eating the grain, they're eating the bugs in the grain before we put it away. And I felt they were very kind and they said only a kind of foolish foreigner would think that they were going to give all these chickens the grain. Any anyway, low tech, um, tried and tested social technology. Uh, that was one of the beginnings of my love affair with India and South Asia. So just another reason I'm happy to be here today. But finally, a project or case study that inspires me today is actually here in France, where I live, in a place called uh, Arles or Atelier Luma. It's one of the few examples in the world that I'm aware of, and hopefully somebody will tell me others, where a group of designers and ecologists and scientists are doing practical work to bring the notion of a bioregion to life, which is to say, they're studying the cultural and agricultural and human resources of their region, the Camargue bioregion, and doing an amazing array of experiments. And out of it come products and services and prototypes and ideas that are animating that whole region. So it's an example, and I hope we can touch on that today, of bioregioning is a lovely idea, but what does it mean in practice to do it? So that's my start of a three. Maybe, um, Ashish, can you introduce yourself? Uh, so my name is Ashish Kotari. I work in uh, the city of Pune in Western India with an organization called Kalpavrik, which is a national uh, environmental action group that uh, we started about 43, 44 years back when some of us were in high school. And uh, since then, I've been working on environment uh, development, livelihoods issues, but especially in the last decade or more on sort of radical alternatives, one of which is bioregionalism. And uh, um, so, yeah, and then currently I help to coordinate uh, two processes. One is called Vikalp Sangam, which is the confluence of alternatives in India, and then the global tapestry of alternatives, similar thing but more globally. Um, do you want me to also narrate my experience and uh, yes, yes or please do yeah, yeah uh, please yes an experience okay. changed you yes well uh, yeah I mean uh, it's kind of hard to decide which one uh, there's lots but I guess in the early part of my getting into environmental activism I think one that really was uh, life changing was a trip through the Himalaya where women, rural women, had launched the what's called the Chipko movement, the movement to hug trees to protect them from being cut down for timber uh, logging. Uh, that's a 1960s and 70s movement. So we went through many villages where these women were active. And for me, that was uh, awe-inspiring to see uh, so-called illiterate women who had much greater knowledge about the environment than I did and also the whole gender aspect of uh, environment, which is so crucial. In terms of a uh, project or a case study, um, I've lots, but maybe one that I'll speak about, which I haven't yet visited, but want to, 
is the Kurdish Rojava um, attempt at trying to create a large region of relative peace in the midst of war in the Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey border and uh, a sort of eco-feminist based uh, economy living with the earth and with radical democracy. And for me uh, also as an experience of what uh, local to landscape level uh, regionalism or bioregionalism or biocultural regionalism could look like. It sounds fascinating and I, I'm hoping to visit it next year. Well, wow. okay. Thank you. Swisti, can I leave you to introduce yourself and answer those two questions? Yes, absolutely. So glad to be here with all of you. I'm Srishti Bajpayee. I'm an activist researcher and I am based in Mumbai and more or less same credentials as Ashish in terms of being involved with networks, but additionally um, also working on rights of nature and part of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature serving on their executive committee. Um, I think one, um, one example that has um, that has changed me and continue to inspire me is what I got involved uh, in, in documentation and research about in central India, uh, where the community uh, has been resisting against a mining project in their sacred territories for over two decades. And along with the resistance, which we don't see happen in many of these places is that where they resisted, but with that also began the process of envisioning what kind of uh, societies they want and what would a different economy, what would a different uh, uh, different way of organizing would look like. And in that, um, a lot of inspiration comes from even the sense of that, what is a territory and how do we govern them and um, how do we mark the territories and what are the ecological, social, cultural um, underpinnings of that. So it has been a really inspiring uh, community uh, for me to learn from and uh, to be really uh, gaining a lot of insights from. And it continues to inspire me uh, being associated with them and how the whole transformative processes are emerging in that region. So um, yeah, that is one such example. So back to you, John. Thank you. Um, so wide experience and for anybody who knows even a little about India, the, the Indian continent, there is so much uh, diversity of everything there basically so i don't think we've asked you here to represent the whole thing in one lump um, but tell us my next question i guess is what is it about this word bioregionalism and the practice of it uh, what does it add to the diversity of practices and traditions in india uh, maybe i could start with ashish on that yes thanks uh, john so i think uh... Uh, maybe I could actually start with showing uh, uh, just a single slide because I think that will illustrate the kind of uh, struggle but also the kind of approach that we're trying to promote here in very preliminary ways. So if I have, uh, do I have share screen? Yes. Okay, so if you can see this uh, on, on your screen, what do you see here? Uh, do you see it, John? Yes, thank you. All right. So what you see here is uh, South Asia divided into six, seven countries. Uh, and then if you include China, et cetera, maybe seven or eight countries. Uh, much of these divisions into sort of na uh, nation state political boundaries is a result of colonial history or pre-colonial sort of empires and so on. Uh, and what this has done is it's actually cut uh, ecological landscapes like river basins. Uh, or mountain ecosystems, or, and also cultural landscapes, such as nomadic populations who used to be able to go between India and Tibet before the fence came in the middle, or uh, populations of marine uh, fishing communities who used to be able to traverse anywhere in the Indian Ocean before the nation state boundaries came in. Um, but those uh, connections, ecological, cultural connections have actually been curtailed, stopped, um, and because of which there's all kinds of ecological issues, cultural issues, economic issues, 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 uh, and issues such as, for instance, India being able to make a, a barrage on the Ganga, which has badly affected Bangladesh, China right now thinking of making a big dam, which will affect the flow of water coming into the biggest river in Northeast India, the Brahmaputra, and so on. And so what we're trying to imagine is what would India, or what would South Asia, or what could South Asia look like in a bioregional perspective without these boundaries or with much more porous political boundaries, right? So reimagining the nation state the bio, through a bioregional 
biocultural renal uh, lens. That's what we're trying to kind of imagine. And that's what the incredible potential of an approach like this is. Also, by the way, not just ecological and livelihoods and also such issues, but also importantly, to reduce, maybe even eliminate conflicts, the war-like situations between India and China, India and Pakistan, et cetera, right? So uh, if, if those areas were free of the armies and the fences and were being governed and managed by the local communities, imagine the amount of uh, peace we would be able to achieve and the amount of savings of money, which is currently being just uh, going into the army. So, yeah. I, so I have a follow-up. Thank you, Ashish. I have a follow-up on that, which is that the history of India is, I think you've got this fascinating project about mapping India's bioregions as just getting underway. Uh, before the colonial period, there was a, you know, a vast a, a variety of different ways in which people uh, knew and experienced their regions and their places. Then the colonial period and the districts were imposed upon those. So is it, am I right, 700 districts were the kind of administrative sort of bits of the jigsaw that had nothing much to do with the natural conditions or the cultural conditions of those places? It's absolutely right. Actually, we do have our, the first report of the South Asia Bioregionalism Working Group, which Shishti can speak about, uh, has come out. I'll put the link in the chat for all of you to look at. And that report actually does a mapping of the pre-district, that is to say, in many cases, pre-British or pre-independent India and how people were uh, uh, imagining the landscape, what sorts of regions existed, which were a lot of which were actually biocultural. They were not based on you know, random polit politics, which is unfortunately what's happened now. So it's not just districts, John, it's also state boundaries. Many of the state boundaries are also cutting bioregions. And uh, so that's an attempt to kind of look back at what was. In some cases in popular imagination still is, a lot of these regions are still referred by people by those names, even though the districts and states have cut them. Hmm. Uh, and so then next step would be, can we start building up some sort of people's pressure, uh, policy pressure to re-insert uh, those regions in some way into the governance and planning process? It's going to be a struggle, but that's hopefully the next step. I, I'm going to come back a bit later to this question of how we do it. Uh, but maybe indeed, Srishti, you're involved also in the South, um, in the, the bioregional working group. How, what is the richness of what is still alive in terms of people's either language or memories or practices? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, so, well, the idea of the network came about from uh, from a democracy alternative confluence, we called Sangam, that had happened here in India, where all of us were discussing about what kind of a governance, an alternative governance model could look like. And that resulted into thinking from more than human perspective, because most of our modern institutions are anthropocentric. We only think about human, um, human limits and human boundaries and serving humans. So the intention was also to think about what it would be really to govern when we keep the rest of nature also in mind. And so this bioregionalism working group came about uh, in thinking from that perspective. And so the intention is that wherever these um, these visions are alive, uh, we begin uh, discussing about them. Um, one, and we see uh, that in several communities that people are involved in, that sense of um, what is a territory, how do we govern those territories? Like the community that I was mentioning to you about earlier in central India has these uh, different, what they call in, uh, 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 what they call as ilakas, but these were the territories that they came up with. Uh, and the, there were certain groups and clans that would control these territories. So we see in various narrations of how people have defined territories based on the ecological um, and political uh, underpinnings to it. And so begin exploding that. Or if you see in North India, uh, the Garhwal and the Kumau region in the Himalayas in Uttarakhand is possibly defined in a way uh, of its ecological uh, conditions and also the accessibility of it. And even how people begin to define uh, the kind of people live there. So Garhwalis, because the region is a bit harsh, are a little harsher people. Mm -hmm. Kumaunis, the, uh, the climate of it is much nicer and pleasant. So Kumaunis are nicer people. So it's also like all of these um, oral traditions of how people even 
imagine or believe or you know come up with these things are very less explored and so the idea of this group is to also bring these more into the picture we begin talking more about them see how also when we are planning uh, we keep regional planning in mind so uh, thinking about how do we say think about Delhi as a city and what would a regional planning in Delhi look like not just in a city but uh, the regions around it and the ecological causes and conditions that bring it together. So these are some of the attempts uh, that we are trying to make and also trying to learn from other parts in the world where such attempts have been made and what were the challenges and how do we move forward with them and what would um, then uh, talking to governments or policymakers would look like. But importantly, being grounded in communities own visions of what are territories and um, other such things. So this process of mapping uh, bioregions that, that people used to, like, presumably the languages were different in the past, but what are the, uh, what is working well with the mapping process? Are you kind of un, un discovering a lot of potential that was you thought might have disappeared, or is it a, a rather desolate picture? How realistic do we need to be about the the potential here? Well, I'll I'll uh, reflect on this first, and maybe Ashish can also add this that. Uh, what uh, the initial bits have found, uh, uh, the objective of this kind of a mapping was to demarcate the historical spatial regions on a physical map and then describe the uh, distinguishing natural characteristics of a fairly uh, large identified regions and then overlay the pe present district boundaries on the pre-district maps to identify how the modern districts are constituted during the old regions. So the first attempt is to just identify that and bring that out uh, in the public space and then actually begin dialogue and more conversations are it. Uh, what we realized in this process was that a very little work even is being done on um, identifying these ex existing territories and regions and much more work is needed. So our intention is that once we begin this process, more layers of it will come out, say how languages were connected, how um, cultures were connected, how the, uh, how the boundaries were then mapped out. But uh, to us, it seems that it is a worthwhile process to get into. So at this moment, it's very initial and possibly only one of its kind, but we are hoping that more we get, dig deeper into it, the more um, rich uh, this kind of work would become. And then possibly then taking it up in terms of how do we map it in urban spaces, like the next attempt is to do it at Delhi city level. What, are, what would a regional planning of a city of Delhi would look like? Then what, how would the localized food systems look like and other such things? So it's all slowly beginning, but that's what the intention is. And uh, also with other kinds of studies that we are undertaking in terms of understanding uh, local traditional governance systems. This is also our exploration, like the one that we are doing in uh, Ladakh, uh, the Trans Himalayan region of North uh, India, uh, where we're trying to understand that how do people conceive um, the ideas of territory and governance from a more than human perspective or a place-based perspective, and then how that can actually um, feed into the existing governance systems. So it seems possibilities are quite a lot, but in the current scenarios, how much would it be really accepted as a challenge all the time? Uh, but at least we begin talking about these. Um, so there could be some potential of change um, in some places. Thank you. And Ashish, on following up from that, um, I read this fascinating um, interview with um, Amitav Ghosh about the legacy of colonialism is that a lot of the nomadic peoples were forced by the new administrators to settle by rivers and that those patterns of habitation inherited from that time that have disrupted not just previously nomadic styles of life, but also what people responding to floods and so now, like in Pakistan recently. Is it, is it a battle to relate um, the historical memory to the present situations or is it something that people say, yes, it's, it's so obvious? It is a huge battle because one of the things I wanted to add to what Shishti was saying and also in response to your question, John, uh, one of the biggest problems is our education system. Uh, you know, the British left us an education system where uh, kids are basically supposed to fit into the current system, no? uh, you know, join a government job or join a corporation or whatever it is. Um, and not actually, uh, there's very little of the history of their own place 
forget about the rest of the world but even their own place the ecology of their own place which is in the formal education system uh we we've, we've been doing some sort of local place based education some of our colleagues have been working on it and they're shocked when they go in and see textbooks which have absolutely no local ecological and cultural relevance they're coming from new delhi or some state capital right which is got which is very different um and uh, so the idea of being able to do remapping or even renaming uh and then to bring those back into the understanding of young people of children and 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 students is absolutely crucial so one of the biggest tasks will be working with or trying to put pressure on state education systems to see how can some of this be integrated into the curricula or it or maybe in the non formal systems um so that the children actually know that they're part of kumau and garhwal and not just part of the districts that you know their school texts are telling them about or about some bio region which in fact is so very important or even telling them that the ganga is the ganges is not just in india it's also in bangladesh and it originates there are uh, tributaries in uh, nepal etc and so therefore the three countries need to work together uh, to be able to actually uh, govern and manage the, the ganges in a proper way so that kind of uh, thing is abs- is really really important which also then brings up the whole idea of what is the local knowledge systems that are still available how are these uh, the the ganges is not called the ganges or the ganga all across its territory it's got different names right or if you take mount everest mount everest is a colonial name that was given to that mountain it's sagarmatha in uh, nepal it is uh, i forget now the chinese name uh, so uh, kimilongma or something yeah so bringing those also back because then that gives you a sense that in fact there is a few thousand years of knowledge and history and culture and language and food which is my heritage and which is not being taught to me because my textbooks are from outside so i think that kind of thing is uh, is absolutely crucial and and this is also something so when you're talking about nomadism you know in our schools we were taught that nomadism is a primitive old outmoded way of living it's only because we started working on ecological issues that we realized that no in fact it is an extremely sophisticated and extremely uh, for those ecologies in fact one of probably the only way uh, in which uh, large landscapes can be sustained along with all the cultural and other aspects that are part of nomadism so then this whole issue which comes up now with the youth in the nomadic communities because those youth unfortunately are being taught in schools where also they are being taught that your what your parents are doing is outmoded you need to get into computers you need to xyz right so how does one bring the which is not to say that all young people should be pushed back pushed into nomadism or into mm-hmm. agriculture or whatever but how do you create a situation in which all these occupations and the ways of looking at the landscape which as shrishti keeps saying is not just human but also more than human how do you create a situation in which people accept that that's as relevant and respected or to be respected as say learning modern science and technology or computers or whatever so not to deny that but to say okay these are equally important and then you have a choice and maybe you can even integrate the two you can create hybrid knowledge systems which uh, integrate both of these at that kind of bio regional bio cultural regional scale so uh, these i mean these are enormous challenges we know tackling for instance the government education system is like a humongous thing but we have to start somewhere and the more exciting we make these Uh, ideas old and new ideas let's say the more young people kind of say oh yeah this is something that's really exciting i'm very bored with what's being taught to me in school this is really exciting the more the possibilities of opening up those spaces uh, for this reeducation or or de-learning or unlearning that has to happen so if it's any competition i'm sure you already know this my experience is that there's incredible interest and openness to these new ways and new subjects of learning just a small example was not so small but in scotland i have friends in the bioregional world there who are working with local schools and it's incredible energy and positive excitement when you give younger school students the opportunity to find out about their own place so and it's not even the individual teachers that's the problem the system yes is an obstacle because it's very slow to evolve but if we imagine that a large number of school students a very large number of their teachers would so love to do more of this discovery of their own places this is i think a global phenomenon it's up to us to figure out how we can help them do that and then how one changes the big system is a another question but we can maybe come back to that um can i just ask about the um um 
there's so many potentials here. What do you think, um, Ashish, you can achieve realistically in the next three years in terms of you've started these different pieces of work, there's a lot happening. Um, is there anything that you're achieving, by, and especially if there's anything that people here can maybe uh, assist or at least know about? Well, uh, two things. Uh, I mean, first of all, for me, uh, what's realistic is not what's necessarily... Well, I mean, I, I tend to think of what's realistic in a, in a somewhat more optimistic manner, because I think uh, human beings and societies are capable of quantum jumps and leaps. Uh, we're not necessarily stuck in the same place, though right now it seems like we might be. Uh, but okay, if you're saying three-year horizon, I think uh, for us, for the working group as an example, more such uh, uh, outputs and reports and understanding and being able to dig deeper into what could uh, bioregionalism look like uh, for South Asia, uh, more dialogue with people across South Asia. This is absolutely crucial, people-to-people -people dialogue, uh, people who are struggling on similar things across our boundaries, uh, being able to come together to, to reimagine those boundaries and landscapes and, and seascapes. Um, and then um, uh, working maybe with some state uh, uh, governments or, or education agencies, to, as I said, sort of bring some of these things also into school and college curricula, maybe introduce some of these things into the political science curricula or the geography curricula. I mean, I, there's no reason why geography, for instance, should not have bioregionalism as its core subject, right? Which in India, it doesn't. So maybe some of that kind of work would be what seems like in the next three years but also laying the seeds for um, some of that actual transformation on the ground. Let me just give you one quick example of another thing I was inspired by, which actually shows the possibility on the ground. Uh, Shristi mentioned local governance, right? So local community governance or direct democracy, as we say. Um, in uh, Western India, there was an experiment which ran for about 15 years for, the, for an entire river basin called the Arvari Basin, about 400 square kilometers, to be governed by the 60, 70 villages that were living in that basin without worrying about district or block boundaries, political boundaries, right? And they did that for something like 13 to 14 years. They created a people's assembly, uh, sorry, a people's parliament for the entire river basin. And they actually governed it in that sense, looking at water sharing from upstream all the way downstream, um, protecting the, the catchment forests and many other things. Um, for various reasons that didn't last beyond 15 years. But that's got some amazing lessons of what the possibilities are for on-ground implementation of, uh, of an approach like this. Is the history of that experiment um, easily accessed? Has, has somebody written about it, filmed it? Um, are the people still around who were involved and led that experiment? Yeah, unfortunately, not very detailed case studies, but there are some stories uh, and there is some uh, filming that's available. We can make that uh, those okay. links available to you. Sure. Okay. Thank and the you people, so yeah, the people who are involved are very much around. So okay. if somebody wants, they could dig, dig deeper into it and do a better documentation. Than what I'm, going to put, I'm going to put that on my little list of follow-up items. But <laughs> Shristi, if I could come back to you, um, Ashish mentioned uh, this idea of creating the conditions for indigenous knowledges to be taken seriously and respected and to be part of our exploration do you can you do what do you, what do you think when do these conditions come from how do we create conditions where different knowledge systems are taken seriously rather than just um, ignored do you have a, an idea about that well i don't know uh, there there are so many um, aspects uh, to those conditions um, but I think beginning to uh, happen in terms of uh, creating the space where people can themselves actually share about these knowledges, because a lot has happened in terms of uh, uh, indigenous peoples and other local communities knowledge being documented by say people like us, and then used uh, while they not, not necessarily having uh, the access to uh, spaces where they can share their knowledges by themselves. So one, I think, is the responsibility for all of us where we can create systems where people can share their knowledges um, uh, with everybody. And the respect for those knowledges in being able to govern their territories in terms of planning, in terms of when we are introducing uh, new projects, uh, when we are introducing um, any of the laws and the acts, uh, how do we include that? So like, for example, several laws and uh, policies that are made are completely detached from the ground reality or people's experiences or knowledge of what it is to govern those territories. 
Um, for example, in India, uh, when the Rights of Rivers uh, judgment was passed, it did not even include the mention of people's knowledge of connecting with rivers or governing the landscapes. But we know that people have been governing these landscapes and being dependent on them uh, for a long time and not as ownership, but as custodians. So how do we create those processes where these knowledges are not co-opted yet included in their true spirit where people truly are given rights and um, uh, power to actually govern them uh, as also means of protecting. So it's not just them, but also several people who understand see, these landscapes and other such things. And it is becoming a lot more important uh, in terms of uh, creating those spaces where we bring that. And I think uh, for us as e activists, researchers, people with access to some spaces or privilege, it becomes even more important how do we uh, facilitate those dialogues um, and spaces for exchange and greater knowledge among people also and also um, the governments, corporations, whatever it then be. Thank you. <clears throat> We've come to a kind of a halfway point, and I promised that I would open this up to everybody who's here. Um, if you have anybody questions right now uh just let me know and we'll um hear from you does anybody have any questions on the topics that we've touched on so far i just wanted to point out that jan golding put a good question in the chat he had to leave but um if we look in the chat the question is how do you think the massive rollout of Aadhaar, the indian social credit system will affect efforts towards bioregionalism does either of you want the answer to go? But uh, um, Ashish, do you know about this? What? How do we respond to that question? Well, <laughs> uh, that's a uh, it's a question with a lot of complex uh, underpinnings to it. So the Aadhaar, for those of you who might not know, is a universal identification system that the government of India brought in a few years back with uh, lots of opposition to it, but they nevertheless brought it in. So we're all supposed to be actually having a single identity system, uh, number. Uh, which then enables us to access all kinds of services, etc. Um, how will that affect the bioregionalism thing? I, I mean, that's it's a bit difficult to answer unless we actually get into the the the, um, the complex politics of uh, how governments are trying to control citizens in India, right? So the whole surveillance state. Uh, is uh, gets much more powerful when you have something like the Aadhaar system because we all uh, have a single database now with somewhere in some government system also incidentally accessible to corporations because it was private corporations who put the system into place. Um, and um, so if, for instance, I am trying to, let's say, uh, advocate uh, a transboundary approach, say, between India and Pakistan or India and China, uh, Tibet, um, or I'm trying to stop uh, a dam from coming in because it will disrupt the bioregional landscape, um, the possibility of my being targeted is that much higher because I'm there, I'm visible in the government system much more than possibly was the case before this, uh, uh, this particular system was put into place. So in that sense, Aadhaar is one of the elements by which the state controls its citizens and therefore also possibly controls dissent or controls uh, so-called deviant ways of thinking and acting and doing, um, it, it is indirectly in that sense connected and makes things, makes fundamental transformations that much more uh, difficult, but that much more necessary. Because unless we really fight for that radical democracy on the ground and then the landscape level approaches, uh, we're going to see more and more of these kinds of uh, state I'm, authoritarian. Let, let me be, be, a, be a bit provocative here because this is, uh, I've followed it a bit more closely in China, where they have, again, they're piloting various forms of social credit system. In India's thousands of cultural histories, there were many ways in which people would exchange value, uh, help each other, have systems of solidarity that did not involve money and cash. Is, there, is it impossible to imagine using contemporary technology to reanimate those non-money forms of exchange and value sharing, or am I just being a bit naive? No, not at all. I mean, Shishti, if you come in, please, after my response, but um, not at all, John. That's one, that's part of our, uh, uh, our vision for alternative transformations, that we actually bring back an economy of caring and sharing, which is not money-based, or much less money-based than it is right now. 
Um, and in fact, a lot of the transformation, uh, transformative uh, initiatives that we've documented, I'll put a website on which has more than 2000 stories of transformation on the ground uh, in India. Um, many of them actually involve human connections, uh, community labor, uh, bringing back uh, collective systems of work and sharing, uh, which go well beyond uh, money. And uh, we don't yet have, like in Europe, some of the alternative currency systems, et cetera, but we, you know, we still have lots of barter. We still have lots of exchange of that kind. We still have a lot of uh, what in Europe is now called time banking. It's been there for thousands of years in India. The, the question is, because a lot of that is also disappearing under the impact of the capitalist uh, monetary system or the statist monetary system, how does one sustain those which still exist and then bring them back where they have disappeared and that's where these alternative transformations are absolutely crucial but it is it's not just naive thinking it's absolutely essential thinking that we have to bring these back this is frankly for me why we're having this discussion today the fact that we're not inventing things from zero these practices existed for thousands of years um, is there anything we can add at this moment to how what are the best ways to um identify and nurture and look after and develop these practices that have been on so to speak on the retreat until now i'm personally convinced that they're coming back i don't actually just know how Srishti, do you have a what would you say to the notion of what works in terms of uh identifying and helping practices that might have become marginalized until now Yes, so actually uh, our attempt, uh, as Ashish was saying, our attempt through the alternative confluence process or the Vikalp Sangam process at India and then the global tapestry of alternatives more at a global level is that several of these practices where people are resisting that they don't go away um, or uh, are, um, are still being practiced or innovated or mixed with modern and traditional knowledge systems, remain intact and um, how do we bring those stories more out, um, share a lot more and create uh, spaces for collaboration and exchange between them. So for example, the one community that I was mentioning about has been working towards uh, protecting their, uh, governing their territories, which actually promote more sustained livelihoods, uh, which are ecologically sound and conscious and also uh, protecting their landscapes. Um, that kind of an experience of resistance and on ground economic and social transformation could be a really inspiring experience for in, for something that's happening, say, in Latin America, where also communities are struggling against mining projects and trying to protect their territories. So how do we create more exchanges and dialogues where many of these experiences are shared, learned from, um, and one is not feeling alone in their struggles about protection or feeling backward that they're protecting their territories or the existing livelihood, but rather as a way of, uh, and that's what a lot of communities are articulating. This is our way of existence. This is our way of being, and we, are, we have a sense of pride for how it is. Um, so, it's also um, about creating those solidarity networks uh, among communities and how much we can nurture those and create those is, I think, uh, the possibility that all of us uh, in, in, this, in these kind of networks are working towards. Um, and the more we do that, the more um, possibilities of even how better we can do it uh, then would emerge. Can you just tell me a bit about how the Vikat uh, Sangam process work? What physically happens to, to cause these traditions to be, I don't know, captured is the wrong word, but to sort of nurtured and stewarded? What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis in the process? So, uh, well, the, uh, the process began in 2014 after uh, the realization that we do say this is what we don't want. Say, for example, we will say that we might not want capitalist uh, monetary systems, but we don't work enough towards saying what kind of monetary systems do we want, what examples do we already have, or what do we need to create. So having just a space where people talk about alternatives to um, whatever we are critiquing. And so the intention has been to bring communities, organizations, who are working on these on ground, but their stories are rarely come out uh, in mainstream media or public domain or even within civil society because we are so uh, focused on saying what's going wrong, which is absolutely important and we should uh, focus a lot on that, but we cannot ignore what's also positive happening on the ground, what people are doing to transform their lives or protect their lives. 
Um, so the idea of Vikalp Sangam process is to create platforms, exchanges, uh, where all of these, uh, these communities, peoples, organizations come together to discuss about, to share about what they're doing, what they're experimenting, um, to learn from each other, to critically engage in dialogue of how they can support. The very important part is to create cross-sectoral learnings so that we are not stuck uh, in what we are working. So if you're working on uh, economic issues, we might not be dealing with, say, political or ecological issues. So how do we become more integrated and holistic in our envisioning and our work? So the idea is to bring these various groups and networks together to do that. So one idea is to document these stories, which is the website that I shared on the chat, to just let these inspiring examples from India and across the world out. Uh, the second is to create physical confluences where people actually come together and share about their experiences. The third is to actually um, create spaces for future envisioning, because none of these examples in, in many ways are holistic or perfect, but we can uh, if we have those spaces of better envisioning of futures and trying to collaborate and work with each other, possibilities of having that holism, uh, of course, are there. And then uh, the fourth element of is, is advocacy. How do we put this out much more in dialogue with civil society, with governments, with other such spaces so that it, it, it in some ways can find spaces in policy and decision making. So this is broadly what is Vikalp Sangam trying to do here in India and the global tapestry in smaller ways, creating those solidarity networks um, across the world. Can I ask a quick follow-up? How do you deal with the question of the multiple languages that these traditions presumably would be told in? Do you have a kind of magical solution to that? No, <laughs> I wish we had. Um, yeah, that's a big, huge challenge. Um, um, we have a worldviews with Kalp Sangam coming up in next, um, yeah, next uh, seven days. And it's a big challenge because communities from across India are coming, many don't understand um, the do, uh, the most dominant, Hindi, English, uh, the most dominant languages. And every every region has its own expression of the language. So it, that's a big, big and huge issue. Um, so within India, we try to do that through, um, through ways where we can actually offer as many translations as possible and create as much of no, uh, language democracy as we can, but it's a big challenge. And it becomes even bigger uh, when we are talking in um, global spaces. Um, and we try to reduce it, but elimination of it is, um, I think, still way, <laughs> it's in horizon. But right now, yeah, that's a challenge. And I don't think so we can fully resolve it, but at least be, being conscious of it and trying to do it each time um, is what we are trying to um, do or focus at the moment. I know. I see a name here that I recognize, uh, Babitha, is uh, uh, another expert on story collecting. I don't know if uh, she wants to chip in at this point, but I'm just curious as to whether anybody here thinks that machine translation, because I think it's crucial what we're discussing, is bringing together all these different uh, knowledges from different places, but also different times. Uh, it's very tough to imagine human beings doing all the translation. Are machines and software going to be any help? Do you, what, what is your view on that? Ashish, are you interested? Do you think there's any in, in potential? John, in John, uh, there's also a ahead. question from Nat Natalie, I think. Oh, sorry, where, is, where, where am I missing the questions? Do people put their hands up? Natalie put her hand up, yeah. Ah, sorry, Natalie. Natalie, let, let, let me hear from you. What What is your question or comment? Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Ashish. I appreciate you making my hand visible. Um, ah, my there it is. Right. Sorry, uh, my fault. No problem. Um, my question is to either of you, um, and I apologize for staying off camera, I'm in motion, but I was wondering if you had a explicit theory of change. And um, by a theory of change, I, I really don't mean the linear, if then um, it's way too complex of an environment. Um, I'm drawing more from Mickey Cashton around um, energy sources. Um, what is to you, um, or uh, what is to your sense of, what is the energy that moves community closer to vision? Um, or however you want to um, uh, define uh, your theory of how transformation happens. Okay, thanks, Natalie. I'll start and then maybe Shishi can add. Uh, so we actually have a, through the Vikalp Sangam process, which she described, uh, we have something called the uh, uh, In Search of Radical Alternatives. And part of that is something called the Flower of Transformation. So this is uh, an attempt to look at uh, transformations taking place in sort of five spheres of life, uh, political, economic, social, cultural, and ecological, um, with a core of ethical values uh, 
sort of at the core of that flower. Uh, and of course, all of them intersecting in uh, none of them, you can't think of any of these separately. Um, but and then to look at cases where transformations are taking place. And what we find is that there's firstly that there's no one single starting point. Some transformations might start with the issue of water, others might start with the issue of uh, gender equality, something else might start with really poor health. Uh, COVID, for instance, was a, a trigger for some transformations, etc. Right. So, or something might be a threat from outside, like a big mining project coming in and people start uh, opposing it, but as they're opposing it, resisting it, they also start transforming internally. Um, so firstly, that there's no single starting point, it's multiple. Secondly, there's no single transformation agent that's universal. One can say people's movements or communities, but that's that's obviously very, very broad and very general. Uh, so we find that it could be uh, women's groups, uh, it could be youth groups, it could be an external agent who comes in and helps to provide the sorts of information that gives the spark to the community to make that transformation happen. It could sometimes even be a, gov a sensitive government officer. Uh, but the crucial thing is in all of these is two things. One, uh, one, a core of ethics, the transformation from, say, an individualistic, uh, only market oriented kind of thing to looking at things as commons, as collective, as solidarity, as local self-reliance before the market, etc. So there's, there's a bunch of common elements there which uh, emerge in many of these initiatives. And secondly, the ability to either sustain, revive, and renew, sometimes even a new way, uh, the community spirit and institution. So uh, collective institution, right? So uh, to, and, and that, that could be an old village assembly kind of thing, or it could be a, a very new form. Uh, these are two, amongst many, these are two very crucial aspects that we see as common. So we don't really have a theory of transformation. That's kind of too big a word for us. But we do have uh, an understanding of how transformations are taking place in multiple dimensions. And then we also have a tool called the Alternatives Transformation Format, which looks at the interconnections between the transformations. Are they complementary? For instance, if economic livelihoods are improving, does that also mean that the ecological status is improving or it's actually getting worse because you're over exploiting the resource, right? Uh, if there's gender transformations happening, does that mean that education is also transforming in a positive way or is it becoming worse, et cetera? So you begin to look at that as a more in a more holistic sense, more sort of a systems uh, way of looking at it, I suppose, um, than uh, simply uh, uh, you know, uh, silos in a silo way. I'll put... Uh, links to both of these, the Flower of Transformation and this uh, Alternatives Transformation format in the chat. So maybe that's a little bit of a response to you, Natalie. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Ashish. And just to reassure everybody that we will, um, I learned this word harvest yesterday from Ben, I think we'll make sure that the, the links that are being put into the chat now will be uh, put at the bottom of the video when it's posted. Um, I wanted to just go on to this notion of support systems because I think we're generating I can just feel it so much interest and uh, you know enthusiasm for learning more but uh, to just to collect lots of stories by itself is not per se a best way of learning things or maybe it is maybe i could ask isabel here i mean you're running a learning center in the same different context south south of southwest england have you figured out yet what is the best way to share these different practices do you have a kind of a practice that you can share with us that works? The stories, whether it's different kinds of stories, is it individuals, is it teachers, is it journeys? What do you recommend? We ran a learning journey quite early on in uh, our existence, and that was a very good way of collecting stories and mapping what was out there. And we would take the story, we went to five different places, and each time we traveled, we'd take the stories of the places we'd been to see to the next places. So we would create that kind of exchange. I, we also have uh, worked with communities along our river, I, asking questions like, if water could speak, what would it say? And those became stories that we could share up and down the river as well. So yes, we do a lot with stories. We do quite a lot with data. You find us at a moment where we are wanting to create some kind of knowledge common, some way in which communities kind of have access to, can generate, can share 
um, data, data not just in the sense of kind of hard facts, but also uh, narrative, know-how, knowledge, all of these very localized things. Um, wondering what that would look like, designing into it at the moment and linking up with other people who want to do this work. But I also wanted to flag up, there was a fascinating um, session yesterday with Amazon Sacred Headwaters, who are on a very similar journey to you, Ashish and Shrishti, and you may already know them anyway through your networks. And they're I'm actually, also... uh, sorry yeah? Isabel to interrupt, but I'm actually on oh. the International Advisory Council of that. So, Perfect, okay. And, and we have, Trishti and I have worked, uh, we did a joint article together, which I think is what we sent to John also. Yes, that's no, that's a, correct. It is what you sent to John. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So clearly a lot of us are kind of on the same path at the moment. I, so what you're saying about um, seeing landscapes differently, valuing local peer in our place. We work with our local water company. We work with local government, but we're also thinking about how can communities take much more action themselves without waiting to um, be given the kind of the, the green flag by anybody. Um, just yes. one more thing, Isabel, if I could just jump in, because you on your site, you told me about a quite fascinating paper from 1982 by Donella Meadows about how do we share knowledge effectively about natural living systems? And she made, and I think John Todd was one of the people in that conversation, she yeah. made the point that it's a, it's a dilemma because every bioregion, every ecological place is unique, almost by definition. Therefore, if it's unique, you can't just learn by wrote how to run a watershed that's done in India versus one in Southwest England. But she's then the, rather beautifully put it that we need to learn how to separate the knowledge and the practice and the skills that are relevant in all places from those that are unique to the particular place. So there's a kind of two levels of information and learning we have to get good at. Quite why we haven't mastered this since 1982, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, we, we start again now of learning to seek out from around the world. And that's what's so fascinating about the Vikap Salangam process is you have different kind of geographical scales, as far as I can tell. Yeah, what is what do we need to know? What, the, what can these guys tell us? What can we help them with? And then separate that from the stuff that's unique to the place. Yeah, now I very much like what Ashish in particular was saying about the transformation. We need both a code of ethics and a spirit of renewal. And that's absolutely true. I think I'm right in, in kind of succinctly condensing what you said, Ashish, but that's uh, absolutely, we would concur with that. And I think a spirit of renewal yeah, comes from telling stories, telling stories about what's mm. possible. Ashish, over to you. No, no, absolutely. I think storytelling is the most powerful way of doing it. And especially also if the storytelling can happen face to face between communities learning from each other and not just from people like us. Um, but I was what I was going to add was to say that, uh, you know, we, we often get asked, OK, how do you replicate this experience or how do you upscale this experience? Because everybody's used to this idea of just making something bigger and bigger and bigger or copying yeah. it from one place to the other. And our response has always been that it's neither. It's actually outscale, which is to say, learn the crucial lessons from somewhere else where something is working, especially the ethics and the processes. And then come back home and look at one's own context, ecological, social, economic context, and modify it and use it, uh, use those lessons for mm -hmm. ourselves. But never copy and never upscale. Upscaling is what, unfortunately, even many NGOs try and do, just become bigger and bigger and bigger, and then they become the same bureaucracies that they used to oppose. So, yeah, so it's outscaling is what we try and, try and promote. I've been very inspired in this uh, meeting and the, the bits of the, the summit I've been to is that everybody seems to have got this. We're not looking for global solutions. We're looking for a multiplicity of solutions with certain common values running through them. And I must say that I think that's an easier prospect, frankly, than trying to find some method of running a bioregion that is applicable around the world. But the values that we share are a bedrock upon which we then develop lots of te techniques for our place. We have a couple of minutes left. Um, I think it's probably polite and desirable to stick to our time. Uh, does anybody have any last comments or Martha? Yes, please uh, tell us. Hi, thank you, John and Shristi and Ashis. This is so amazing. Um, I'm thinking a lot about um, migration and how many people 
are forced out of their region into a new region. Um, and they all bring with them bioregional knowledge from where they come. Um, are there ways that you are working also with non-local, non-originally local communities to help them to integrate? Because I think if they're able to integrate, if they're able to contribute, um, they automatically become part of the land that they're now living in. Uh, the place becomes theirs even if it's not their ancestors' place. So are there some things that you are considering in that respect? Um, I can start in maybe then Ashish, you can add. Um, so that that is a huge challenge, Martha, and a very difficult one as well, especially in the times of climate change. For example, um, from a neighboring country, Bangladesh, a lot of people are migrating into India. And that's where I think also the conflict of identity, citizenship, and all of that is also erupting. Um, and can we uh, truly say that uh, India is not responsible for anything that's happening in Bangladesh? Well, that's not true. So also there are climate refugees and people uh, getting displaced or losing their sense of place. Uh, and right now there's uh, that is that is again something that we have in mind to do that exploration much more because that's where the real challenge of actually bringing that sense of place back uh, where people have been disconnected from their lands um, and trying to uh, embed themselves in new landscapes and what that governance would look like or just being there look like that challenge is a big one uh, which we have in horizon and in mind but not yet fully uh, say embedded into exploring that. Uh, what we are seeing is that um, the examples of the possibilities do exist. For example, several intentional communities of people who have never lived in a certain landscape, move to a new landscape and get to know it better. So what are the modes of getting to know a land um, could be developed, could be harnessed, could be nurtured, where the where then people start caring about or, uh, you know, living with the land or living with that territory. And we have several examples of such intentional communities that have, of course, over the years, say 30, 40, 50 years, developed that relationship. So the possibility as other examples do exist, but us seeing it especially from the, uh, because wherever these intentional communities have been, they are mostly from people or economic backgrounds who could afford to do that. But in the case of people being displaced or being refugees, it's a very different dynamic because the, the dynamic is also of just existence, which is so much more difficult for them. So how will that pan out is something that is worth exploring, which we are not yet into, but we do have that in mind. I'm going to draw this to conclude. I just want to draw your attention to a quite fascinating comment from Miguel Quinones in the, the chat about people like me says, how do you manage the watershed? What is the kind of the governance arrangements? What about the financing, which is kind of a, a Western preoccupation? But then Miguel says, well, maybe we could exchange what are the beliefs and principles in regards to what is wished for? What are their symbols, rituals, and taboos? I can just imagine that would be a quite fascinating session maybe for another time. Um, I am going to draw this to a close because I think it's just polite and people are busy and it's Saturday. Can I just thank you very warmly, Ashish and Srishti for coming. Uh, can I thank Isabel and Ben and the whole crew behind this virtual scene of the summit for making all this possible. Um, I will do my best to make sure there's no delay in the posting of the video and the, the harvesting of the content of the links. But uh, with that, thank you all for coming. And it's been for me just a very wonderful hour. And thank you so much, everybody. Mm. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Great session. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Take Bye. Care. Bye. 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 See you soon.